and welcome to this special look behind the scenes of Pensacola Opera's production of HMS Pinafore. I'm Cody Martin, the Director of Education and Assistant Conductor. We are so excited to be able to continue our main stage season this spring following a successful and innovative production of Bizet's Carmen in January. We enjoyed three wonderful performances inside the Sanger Theater while also live streaming two of those performances to virtual audience members around the country. After nearly a year without live performances, it has been such a joy to bring music and live theater back to life in our community. And now, we continue this season like no other with a hilariously energetic production of Gilbert and Sullivan's classic operetta, HMS Pinafore. In this video, we'll take a look into operetta's most enduring composer librettist team, as well as some musical details that you can listen for as you watch the performance. First, let's learn a little bit more about Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert and Sullivan were a Victorian-era composer librettist team who were behind some of the most beloved operettas of all time. Librettist William Schwenk Gilbert was born in London in 1836. His father was a writer and a formal naval surgeon. His mother was a homemaker and his parents did not have a great relationship with each other or with any of their children. They also had three younger daughters in addition to William. Gilbert began to take interest in theater early on, writing plays and working on scenery for school productions as a child. And then after finishing school, between some brief military and law experience, he continued to write a variety of genres for various publications, um, including a series of illustrated comics, which he published under the pen name Bab, which was a childhood nickname of his. And these illustrated comics were eventually compiled into a publication called the Bab Ballads, and these became the inspiration for some of his later work in plays and comic operas. Gilbert married Lucy Turner, nicknamed Kitty, in 1867, and the pair never had any children, although they were both animal lovers and acquired many pets over the years. Gilbert continued to write plays, burlesques, other musical entertainment pieces during the 1860s, and then from 1869 to 1875, Gilbert collaborated multiple times with composer and theater owner Thomas German Reed for what were called the German Reed Entertainments. These were family-friendly musical theater productions, and the idea of these was to show that respectable theater could still be popular. Because during this time, the genre of theater had kind of fallen into disrepute, and there were so many burlesques and farcical pieces that people just didn't take theater seriously at the time. Um, so Thomas German Reed, along with Gilbert, were trying to just show that these could be good pieces and actors could take them seriously and families could enjoy them. Many plot elements from the German Reed entertainments would also reappear later in the Gilbert and Sullivan pieces. And this was when Gilbert developed his topsy-turvy style, which would come to be a defining characteristic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Now when we say topsy-turvy, we mean that all of the humor is derived by Gilbert setting up this ridiculous situation at the beginning of the piece, and all of the characters within the piece work out the consequences of the situation logically and seriously, so that characters are not playing into the jokes at all, they are acting seriously and just within the confines of what Gilbert has set up from the beginning of the piece. And then in 1871, Gilbert was commissioned to work on a holiday piece with composer Arthur Sullivan, and that's where their collaboration began. Composer Arthur Sullivan was born in London in 1842. He was the younger of two brothers, and their father was a military bandmaster and clarinetist. So he had an early predisposition to being a musical person. Uh, Sullivan took an early interest in his father's work with the band, and he learned to play most of the instruments at a very young age. He composed his first piece for the band at age eight. It was an anthem called By the Waters of Babylon. And when he was 14, he was awarded a Mendelssohn Scholarship to study at the Royal Academy. Uh, he studied there for two years under his teacher, John Goss, who was actually a student of one of Mozart's pupils. So Sullivan was only three degrees away from Mozart, which is something really interesting to learn. After he finished at the Royal Academy, Sullivan went on to study at the Leipzig Conservatory for three more years, and he graduated in 1861. 
After finishing his studies, he worked as a church organist to support himself during his early career years, while all the while continuing to compose and establish himself as a composer. His first attempt at writing an opera was The Sapphire Necklace, which he wrote in 1864. And this piece was never performed, and the score and libretto have since been lost. Sullivan also composed the music for a very well-known popular hymn in 1871 called Onward Christian Soldiers. And this was also the same year that he met Gilbert and began collaborating with him. In 1871, Gilbert and Sullivan were commissioned by the Gaiety Theatre in London to write Thespis or The Gods Grown Old. This was a burlesque style comic opera uh, dealing with a troupe of actors who take over for the Greek gods on Mount Olympus. And most of the music for this first collaboration has been lost. There's a few musical numbers we still have uh, the scores for, but no complete score was ever published. Over the next 25 years, Gilbert and Sullivan would work together and compose 14 comic operas altogether. They became the most prolific, well-known, respected creators of comic opera during the Victorian era. Their second piece, Trial by Jury, was in 1875, and it was a one-act spoof of law and the legal profession, uh, drawing from Gilbert's experience during his early career years. And this was important because it introduced a signature patter baritone role that would become a fixture of all of the Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Uh, this was a lead role that was always a comic character, always played by a baritone, and the word patter just means that they had lots of words, you know, lots of fast singing, um, and this is something that we would find in almost every Gilbert Sullivan piece to come. In this first piece, Trial by Jury, the patter role, the learned judge, was played actually by Sullivan's brother, Fred. Among the remaining 12 collaborations between Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, the most popular and still most frequently performed three pieces would be The Pirates of Penzance, The Mikado, and of course, HMS Pinafore. So the full title of HMS Pinafore is actually HMS Pinafore, or The Last That Loved a Sailor. And this was kind of a take on Mozart's titling of his operas. They always had an alternate title. Um, and so Gilbert and Sullivan did this for many of their pieces as well. Uh, Pinafore was written in 1878. And just a quick walkthrough of the plot, it all centers around class distinctions aboard a British naval ship that is anchored off of Portsmouth. So everybody's in a different class, and we learn about, you know, the power of love to level all ranks. Um, so we have Josephine, the daughter of Captain Corcoran, and she is in love with Rafe Rackstraw, who is nothing but a lowly sailor. However, she's also fielding a marriage proposal from Sir Joseph Porter, the first Lord of the Admiralty that her father has arranged. In Act 2, after Captain Corcoran thwarts the young lover's attempted elopement, Miss Buttercup, who is a bumboat woman aboard the ship, comes forth with a secret she has been harboring beneath what she calls her gay and frivolous exterior. And this will bring a twist that changes everything at the end of the opera. So Gilbert and Sullivan began a collaboration with talent agent and opera impresario Richard Doyley Cart in 1875. And Cart had gathered a group of backers to create his own company, specifically designed to produce these English comic operas. Because of this, the team was able to have much more control over their piece, everything from the sets to the costumes to who was going to be playing each role, um, rather than what was kind of customary, that everything was up to the theater where a piece was going to be premiered. HMS Pinafore was Gilbert and Sullivan's third collaboration with Cart following Trier by Jury and The Sorcerer. Almost every main character in the piece was either inspired by or drawn directly from Gilbert's earlier Bab ballads, and the nautical setting was inspired by Gilbert's father's early career as a naval surgeon. Sir Joseph's character was based upon a real-life First Lord of the Admiralty, W.H. Smith, and he, like the character Sir Joseph, rose to his position despite having no military or sailing experience. As director of the premiere production, Gilbert strived for complete realism in costumes and scenery. This is a concept not common at the time. Um, Gilbert actually went and visited ships at Portsmouth to model the sets from. He also believed highly in realistic acting, which was something else unfamiliar to Victorian era performers. 
Uh, he was known to be a very strict director, demanding precise movements and even very specific inflections in how the actors delivered their lines. HMS Pinafore opened at the Opera Comique in London on May 25th, 1878. It was preceded in a double bill by The Spectre Night, uh, which is a now unperformed operetta by Alfred Sellier and James Alberry. It ran for 571 performances in the initial run, which was at the time the second longest run ever for a musical theater piece. The popularity of Pinafore quickly spread around Europe and then across the Atlantic to the US. And in the US, over 150 unauthorized productions soon appeared stateside. Some of these productions in the US featured alternate castings, such as all child casts. Gilbert Sullivan and Cart had no international copyright protection at the time, um, so they were paid no royalties for these pirated productions in the US. But they did quickly arrange for an officially authorized production in the US, which would open on Broadway at the Fifth Avenue Theater on December 1st of 1879. The piece had a great first week, uh, but there was a quick drop off because many people in the US had already seen these pirated productions, so they feel like they had already seen HMS Pinafore. So the team quickly rushed to finish their next collaboration, The Pirates of Penzance, which would premiere just a month after HMS Pinafore did in the US on December 31st. So The Pirates of Penzance and HMS Pinafore, both nautical pieces, uh, they went on to be presented together often around the United States over the next few years. HMS Pinafore has become a favorite for companies around the world. There have been 29 Broadway productions in addition to regular appearances at Operetta and Opera Companies worldwide. A little bit about the music in HMS Pinafore. When we talk about Gilbert and Sullivan, this music is as English as English can be. The music is always simple yet sophisticated, very clean, clear harmonies, beautiful lines, never overdone, unless they're trying to make it sound overdone and mimicking Italian opera, which does happen at some point. Sullivan often uses Handel and Donizetti-like recitatives in this piece which you'll hear throughout to kind of move the action along between some of the musical numbers and between the dialogue. The chorus in HMS Pinafore plays a huge role and you see that from the very beginning of the piece, the opening scene is all of the sailors aboard the ship and they sing this number which is modeled off of a traditional sea shanty. So let's listen to a little bit of that now. We sail the ocean blue and the soul sea ships of beauty Be a sober man and true Another melody that makes its appearance a few times throughout the piece is Miss Buttercup's theme. Uh, we first hear it in the overture, and then we hear it in the introduction to the Sailor's Chorus at the beginning. And then we hear the actual aria whenever Buttercup sings it. And so just so you can listen out for what this melody sounds like, this is that melody. So we'll hear that a few times throughout the piece. Listen out for that. One stroke of musical genius that I absolutely love is Sullivan's foreshadowing of one of Josephine's melodies from Act One. So eventually she will sing this aria called Sorry Her Lot, and this is the opening melody of that aria. So that's the melody in the aria, but we actually hear that in the introduction to the opening Sailor's Chorus in a completely different meter, and it kind of just sneaks in there when we're not expecting it. So this is what that sounds like. So Sullivan takes that theme that he's going to use later on in Act 1 and inserts it before we even know what it is, which I think is very clever. 
As I mentioned earlier, Gilbert and Sullivan introduced this concept of a patter baritone comic role, and we have one in this piece, and that is Sir Joseph Porter. So let's listen to a little bit of Sir Joseph's entrance number. This is where he's telling his story, how he came up through the ranks, despite having no experience at sea. As office boy, I made such a mark that they gave me the post of a junior clerk. I served the Ritz with a smile so bland, and I copied all the letters in a big round hand. We copied all the letters in a big round hand. I copied all the letters in a hand so free that now I am the ruler of the king's navy. We copied all the letters in a hand so free that now he is the ruler of the king's navy. So that's just a little bit about the music in HMS Pinafore, and just a few things for you to listen out for. A little bit about our production of HMS Pinafore that you're going to see. This is the second production of the piece here at Pensacola Opera. We've not performed HMS Pinafore since 1984, the second season of our company, uh, so we're very excited to bring it back to our stage. And we'll be continuing our socially distanced, safety-focused concept that we began successfully back with Carmen in January. So throughout staging rehearsals, all performers, crew, and staff have been wearing face masks, face shields, and gloves. We've been limiting the number of people in the room during rehearsals. Uh, we moved into a larger space for all of our chorus rehearsals, so we have lots of air in the room. And we've been limiting the, number, the amount of time we spend during rehearsals in the room as well. During the performances, all principals and chorus members will maintain their physical distance throughout the show. Uh, the orchestra will be on stage again behind the performers and they are all fully distanced. All of the orchestra members will be wearing masks. The wind players will take theirs off when they play and then put them back on when they aren't playing. The string players will keep their masks on the whole time. The audience inside the Sanger Theater will be socially distanced as they were at Carmen. We have a heavily reduced capacity inside the theater, uh, down to about a third of what we usually can fit in there. And we're also continuing to offer our live stream option for Friday and Sunday performances, uh, which is great. It allows our production to be viewed anywhere in the world uh, as long as you can access the internet. We have a great cast for this performance. Our Captain Corcoran is going to be played by Corey McKern, Pensacola opera favorite. Sir Joseph Porter KCB will be played by Corey Trahan, making his debut with us. Josephine, Captain Corcoran's daughter, will be played by Flora Wall, also making her debut. The lowly sailor Rafe Rackstraw will be played by John Risen, a former artist in residence. We're happy to have him returning with us. Miss Buttercup will also be played by a former artist in residence, Emily Trebold. Dick Deadeye will be played by Spencer Reifman, making his premiere with us. And Cousin Hebe will be played by Aaron Alford, our mezzo-soprano artist in residence this season. The Bosun's Mate is played by Jack Chandler, our baritone artist in residence. And The Carpenter's Mate will be played by Curtis Cole, who is a fantastic member of our Pensacola Opera Chorus. We will, of course, be joined by the Pensacola Opera Chorus and the Symphony Orchestra on stage. HMS Pinafore will be directed by stage director Dean Anthony, who has enjoyed many productions with us. I'm very excited to be conducting this production with scenic design by Jefferson Reidenauer, costumes by Glenn Avery Breed and wardrobe witchery, and hair and makeup design by Brittany Rapizzi. Thanks again for tuning in today. I hope that you have learned a little bit more about HMS Pinafore, you know what to listen out for, and I really hope you enjoy the production from all of us here at Pensacola Opera. Thanks again.